Welcome everyone to our webinar. I am Rodrigo Silva. I am the communications manager at Cogitatio. Today we are discussing how algorithms have changed communication in several areas of the digital society we are living nowadays. And the panel we have today to explore this topic is composed of Sane Kruikemeyer from the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands, Johanna Schevel from the University of Hohenheim in Germany, Marieke van der Velden from the Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam in the Netherlands, and Manuel Pascual, journalist of El País in Spain. The topic that we are discussing today is based on an open access issue that we publish in our journal, Media and Communication. I will soon share the link with you folks to access during our event. Some information uh, to our uh, attendees before we start the event. This is the order of presentations for today. So Sane, as co-editor of the issue I, I, I mentioned before, we'll make a brief contextualization of, of the issue, the main findings um, and the contributions. She will be followed by Joanna and Marikan as authors of this issue to share the most important findings and impact of those findings uh, of each article. And then we will uh, be hearing the remarks of uh, Manuel. After that, we will jump to the Q&A session and final discussion with our speakers. And so to our attendees, you are able to write your questions to the speakers in the Q&A format in the bottom of the screen. You can do this throughout the whole session and even vote for your uh, favorite question. Uh, you can also share your ideas, your comments uh, in the chat, which is open for everyone. And if you are on Twitter, one final note, you can also follow us following the handle that you see in the bottom of the screen, Cogitatio Mac, and follow uh, the page to get in touch with our publications, call for papers, the impact of our research, events, etc. And without further delay, I will pass the word to Sene and wish you all a very pleasant webinar. Thank you. Hi everyone, I hope everybody can hear me. I will put on the slides. Perfect. I hope you see uh, not see the presenter mode, that's always the common mistake. Um, but if everything is okay, I will start. Uh, so thank you all for attending this uh, really, uh, I think really nice uh, webinar on our special issue, which I co-edited together with Sophie uh, Boerman and uh, Nadine Bo. which is called How Algorithm System Changed Communication. And I want to start off by uh, giving a broad overview of how our lives are impacted by algorithms and also the automated decision that follow often, uh, often follow these uh, uh, algorithms. So we see that they influence many aspects of our daily life. Um, the ads we see on our Facebook uh, feed, for instance, or on other social media. Uh, we use trackers every day to make sure, especially when working home, that we make those 10,000 steps each day um, and that information is collected. Um, political micro-targeting during an election receive, especially if you cannot campaign offline, a lot of information online via digital ads, for instance, but also other ways in which political parties try to use data to target uh, citizens and uh, voters. Uh, when we read the news, for instance, uh, we see a lot of information uh, which is adapted to, for instance, to, to our interest, uh, especially also on social media. And here in general, also the social media algorithms that decide what we see uh, in pictures, on Instagram, for instance, the, 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 uh, the social media influence, influencers, for instance. And this is all happening online, but we also see that there is an increase uh, of attention also in research focusing on our offline uh, experiences where we see that also the algorithms online try to influence the, the decision we made where we want to eat for instance or um, uh, which hotel we want to book for instance. And to talk about uh, all the different studies in our special issues of course challenge I'm a scientist I could talk for one study uh, for like an hour or something like this so I'm going to talk about the 11 studies in this um, in a special issue, but I will focus on the main conclusion because I think it's interesting to see what comes out of it and how they also relate and how we want to move forward, for instance. So one of the studies by Sawali uh, showed, uh, for instance, that the misconceptions about algorithms are highly prevalent, especially when they regard, <coughs> sorry, if they focus on the media. And we see also clear divides here. So we see, for instance, that especially older people, there were educated people and also women, um, 
have more misconceptions about algorithms that are used in the media. Uh, and I think this, and uh, Brahim uh, mentioned this needs more attention also in future work. That people are also have different uh, uh, misconceptions also related a little bit about people's risk awareness. And this is a study by Festic and, uh, and they focus on health data. And one of the main conclusions in their work was that users are often uh, not very aware of the different risk uh, that are online when sharing health information and also do not apply specific coping strategies. But you also see that a substantial portion is still willing to give their, and this is I think very interesting, share their health data if they get some financial advantages in return. So they are, are willing to share their health data with health insurances if they receive a lot of financial uh, advantages. You also see uh, uh, in also a research on, on algorithms that a lot of research uh, studies focus on the, the harms of it. And if you are very interested in the different types of harms, I would very much uh, care, encourage you to read the Sauerland and Spencer article, which both spoke, focuses specifically on these harms or disadvantages for people in society. They focus, for instance, on the errors that are made um, uh, based on different algorithms used, uh, some undesirable selections, uh, manipulation, which also happened, of course, uh, a lot, especially during elections, discrimination, uh, and gives also a lot of power to the different platforms, for instance, the social media platforms, uh, Facebook or Meta, for instance, but also Google. And if you want to see some of these uh, consequences, I would very much recommend you the, to read the article by Mata Morris um, and also Smets who focus also on the consequences of algorithms. So one uh, study focuses on YouTube and focus on the recommendations. There's a lot of discussion about the impact of these recommendations because if you get in this funnel, right, where you get only the recommendation for specific type of videos and they also show that even though there's a diverse algorithmic driven recommendation, there's still a clearer focus if you focus on next video that the winners pop up. Right, so there's a, a focus on this popular video. And also we see in, in a study by Smets that most of the, the, the algorithms uh, that are used, for instance, to, to collect online uh, data from, from people uh, also have an influence on your offline decisions. For instance, where you sleep, where you eat, where you go, that has a big impact. So today uh, we talk about also my, one of my very favorite topics is the political consequence of algorithms. We focus on news and also specifically on campaigning or political micro-targeting. Because what I think is very interesting is that in our special issue, we not found, uh, we found very more nuanced findings. It's interesting to see that some researchers found that uh, uh, people are a little bit more negative towards the neutrality of algorithms, but other studies there, people are more positive, right? So the, the findings also differ here a little bit. So it shows also more nuanced findings towards, for instance, the neutrality of algorithms. And we also found different type of perspectives. So with regard to news recommenders, the news you see, uh, for instance, on news websites or on social media. Uh, we see that also journalists are impacted by that, so they make certain decisions of what is no newsworthy. But there are also some findings on the other hand, right? So we see also an effect on news uh, consumers. Uh, we see, for instance, as I think interesting in the article by Wieland, that user preference recommendations uh, of users uh, prefer recommendations of, of, of more uh, uh, well-known articles or more favorite articles compared to non uh, or unexpected articles. And the last article, I think, which is also very interesting and very important is an article uh, by Johanna, who she will tell more about it today. So I will not talk about it uh, in depth, but uh, she will talk more about the role of privacy, for instance, with my political micro-targeting. So what is the agenda for the future? So what I believe what this uh, special issue shows are three important things. So the first one is that we need more nuanced insights. So we see in, in one study, for instance, that people are more positive towards the neutrality and some, some studies more, more negative. So it, in there, it depends a little bit on the situation. So we need more nuanced insights. But also we found in all of these studies that there is also a little bit of um, um, yeah, gratification toward more of the negative impacts. Well, I think that we also should study the positive impacts of, impact of automated decision based on AI. 
because I think that it's very important to understand how, for instance, these positive impacts can trump the negative impacts. And we need to know under what conditions uh, um, algorithms can have, for instance, a negative or positive influence. And I think this is really important and also need to know these nuances, right? So for instance, um, in research, uh, for instance, my own research on political micro-targeting, we find, for instance, that um, uh, uh, receiving uh, ads online uh, results in, in uh, more uh, stronger preferences for specific parties, but mainly for people who have less knowledge about politics. So it seems that there are also differences between people. And this is really important. We need to understand these conditional effects. So understanding the actual impact is very important. And also uh, governance of platforms. And it relates a lot to the article by uh, Claire Segein and uh, colleagues who focus also very much on transparency and control. So what do platforms need to do to be informed their users, right? To be transparent, but also what do people need to be in control of their personal data? This is really important. And they offer an overview of all the articles that have been published um, in, in, the, in the last years. And what is also very important, what I think is also uh, uh, needs more attention is a comparative perspective. Uh, we focus a lot on, on, on Western democracies and especially also in the US when it comes to, for instance, political micro-targeting. Uh, well, I think it's very important to also focus on different contexts and make comparisons, what works and what is important in one country and what in, what in another. Uh, I think we don't take uh, the context of, um, of, of uh, of, of countries, for instance, or cultural backgrounds into account. And I think this is really important. So I hope uh, that I give you some uh, an, a nice overview. I'm really looking forward. I'm really happy that uh, Joanna, uh, I hope I pronounce this correctly, Shawel and uh, Marike van der Velde are here today um, to talk about their studies. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, Sani. Great overview. Thank you very much. Uh, Joanna, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I am very happy to be here and to have the chance to talk about our article in this uh, great special issue. Uh, we have a look or had a look in our article on political micro-targeting and the role of privacy, um, as Dana, as Dana uh, already said. And before starting uh, with my um, yeah, information I want to um, share with you, I want to share this picture with you. And uh, yeah, I would like to, you to have a look on it and to think about different um, targeting ads and uh, yeah, political posters you see in the streets before political elections and political events. Um, although this is in German, but I, I think you know what I want to show you. There are very much different political ads from one political party you see in um, yeah, in situations of um, political relevant um, events. And um, if you have a look on these uh, pictures and uh, think about it, um, so I stop my sharing, um, then uh, I would like to ask you, um, do you think that you see all the different ads of one party in a balanced way on your Facebook feed? Or do you think there are some ads you see specifically um, or some ads you don't see at all? And um, maybe did you ever recognize that you see other political ads on your Facebook feed than your friends see, even if it's from the same party? Um, well, this is exactly the outcome of targeting strategies by political parties. And the question you might ask yourself now is which person gets which ad and why? In fact, we are trying to find out, but it's very complex and not uh, that simple. Uh, what we know so far is that political parties um, can use your behavioral data, your social dem demographic data, networking data, and metadata, amongst others, for targeting purposes. So um, this can be your website visits, age, gender, hobbies, communication partners, and time and place of the posting you are doing. Such personal data um, of you is collected, analyzed, and processed, and can be used to persuade you with targeted messages and political ads. And um, this can, of course, influence your opinions or even your behavior. Consequently, it's not surprising that uh, political targeting can pose a threat to democracy and society. Um, but what about the individual role in this um, yeah, situation? What about the individual perception of violated privacy um, of a single person? 
How do you feel when you think about being observed and targeted by third parties you don't know without um, giving your permission? Um, probably it might feel unpleasant because you don't notice it and you can't do anything about it. But uh, most importantly, and one aspect which motivated us for our research on this topic is that it feels unpleasant because it's infringing uh, for your privacy. So your privacy is being invaded actually. Um, however, research on the impact on targeting strategies on psychological outcome variables such as privacy and privacy perception is rare. Um, but we argue that it's very important to consider the impact of targeting processes on individual privacy perception because it affects our subjective perception of self -determin determination and privacy. And privacy, of course, is important because everyone has a need for privacy. Some people need more privacy, some people um, need less privacy in order to feel comfortable, but every person has a specific need of privacy. And the need of privacy or need for privacy can actually be understood as the individual's cross-situational tendency to actively define for oneself, communicate to others and pursue a desired level of privacy. And taking one step further now and following Westin's definition of the, um, privacy from 1975, um, privacy is a higher order need which needs to be fulfilled in order to satisfy um, even more fundamental needs such as self-evaluation, uh, protected communication or uh, autonomy. And if these important needs cannot be met or cannot be met adequately, this can have negative effects on our well-being and mental health. Um, therefore, we should consider users' privacy perception as highly relevant variable in targeting research because targeting research and political targeting is about personal and private data. Um, it's important that an individual has the ability to autonomously act in a digitalized society from our perspective. And therefore, we decided to research the impact of political targeting processes on the perception of privacy in the context of social media and social media affordances because there the political targeting takes place. However, um, as you know, since targeting is designed to be subliminal, it's um, difficult to detect. So on the one hand side, from the user's perspective, it's hard to identify whether an ad was targeted or not. Um, and on the other hand side, for us as researchers, um, it's very challenging to analyze something which is neither tangible nor reportable from users. So we actually need measures for um, observing and tracking, which um, could actually also be critical because um, some people would say it's similar um, to the methods uh, political parties are using for politic, uh, political targeting. So what is more, researching users' privacy in the context of political targeting is a very complex task, comprising of many subtasks. This is the reason why we, we decided to start working on this uh, theoretically and reach our first sub-goal of theoretically um, analyzing the relations between political targeting and online privacy in the context of social media and social media affordances. And social media affordances are very important. Um, they are, um, for example, persistence and anonymity, editability and association. Um, and these social media affordances shape the way we interact with social networking sites and other users on social networking sites. So anonymity, for example, allows us to use uh, Facebook anonymously. Editability allows us to um, yeah, edit messages or profile information. Association allows us to stay in contact with other persons and persistence means, of course, that information is available over longer times um, or periods of times. Um, and all these affordances shape what we share on social media, but also what other people and political parties can see and find uh, in order to contact and identify us. And in our article in this special issue, we uh, elaborate on the development of users' privacy behavior, starting from the very initial assessment of the user of communication and interaction goals when using social media, for instance, uh, Facebook, over the exposure to political targeting, so the situation in which a user um, yeah, sees or perceives uh, some uh, political um, advertisements to resulting privacy experiences and behaviors. And we do this by analyzing research in the field of online privacy and political behavioral targeting and connecting and combining uh, findings from privacy research and targeting research 
um, and building on the social media privacy model, which is a model uh, which takes a very um, relevant role in our article in order to connect and combine different re research findings and then build on this for more empirical research. And according to the analyses along the social media privacy model, which I just mentioned, the individual perception of privacy can vary depending on available privacy mechanisms, for instance, control, and lead to different regulation behaviors. But as I said, in the context of political targeting, privacy regulation is very difficult because A, the users do not notice the targeting event itself, and B, privacy mechanisms might be perceived as being insufficient in this context. So as an analytical result of our theoretical investigation in this article, we um, have um, posed three propositions. The first one would be to consider the complexity of social media and social media affordances as it is covered by the social media privacy, which you find in our article. The second proposition would be to bring privacy into play, and uh, this can be done by considering privacy and privacy regulation as self-sufficient research topics instead of treating it like a control variable or a side product. And furthermore, we should consider privacy as a mediating or even dependent variable in uh, targeting research. The third proposition would be to conduct research following eth ethical uh, guidelines, um, because as indicated before, it's difficult to detect targeting. And um, this is why we need some kind of tracking methods for analyzing targeting, but we must use them in a transparent and responsible way. So why does our theoretical investigation on this topic matter? First, our findings can improve research on political targeting since they bring the psychological perspective into play. And we think, um, as already indicated, that it's unacceptable to exclude users' perception of privacy when analyzing the use of personal, private, sensitive data um, for election success or commercial purposes. So we need to understand, of course, that behavioral outcomes, um, such as voting behavior, is very important to consider, but um, users' perception of privacy is a relevant outcome variable as well. And we um, suggest to propose or to consider this in uh, future research. Um, future questions uh, relate to methods and ethical responsibility um, in the case or in the sense that we need to find research methods allowing for adequately analyzing users' perception of privacy without infringing their privacy, which is very difficult. And uh, of course, we are asking ourselves uh, how this can be implemented, and we consider the combination of different methods, um, namely self-reports for learning about users' experiences, emotions, feelings, um, attitudes, and so on, and automated methods for identifying a situation in which people are being targeted. Um, but the big issue is how to define the balance between gathering valuable research results and considering methods of scraping and tracking, which might be ethically um, questionable if not conducted with caution. Um, and this is something we are thinking about in, in current research we are doing. Actually, we are analyzing data right now of a study we did during the federal election in Germany last year. And if you are interested in that, uh, please uh, don't hesitate to contact us. Um, but uh, referring back to our article here, um, in sum, we can say that we need to improve research in order to improve, improve our understanding of users' experiences of privacy. And yeah, this is uh, our my main finding that we uh, came uh, or that we found in, in our theoretical investigation. And I'm very happy to answer your questions about that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Joanna. We'll be hearing now from Marike van der Velden. So I'll talk about my article together with my colleague Felicia Luchtwach uh, on epistemic overconfidence in algorithmic, uh, algorithmic news selections. Um, yes. So, okay. Yes. So, what is uh, overconfidence, and why do we focus on it? Uh, so we do like think that overconfidence is when somebody is um, really certain, even though they don't have the expertise. And why do we focus on it? Um, is because we want to actually look at like a theoretical contribution in this field. Uh, and we actually are wondering, do people value recommender systems that we all use every day, like you know, these pop-ups from whatever news apps we're following or just on the websites? Do we 
um, appreciate them equally for uh, catching up with our favorite soccer team or other sports team. Um, I'm Dutch and the um, winter uh, Olympic winter games are there. So probably for me will be ice skating as well. Uh, or do we actually value them differently when we look for information about the state of the economy or politics? Uh, and the second, so how do we uh, use different forms of engaging with the news? How do we appreciate like algorithmic curation there? And the other thing is, is that we do know something about that people always have the feeling that, you know, bad things happen to other people just because they're not cautious enough or they're not as bright as I might be. Or, you know, a lot of these negative things we externalize and think uh, a third person has, but it doesn't really apply to me. I'm in some way uh, of, an exact, uh, of an exemption in this case. Uh, so what we do in both the US as, as well in the Netherlands is we actually ask these questions and we're going to study like do people um, care for algorithmic curation and does overconfidence play a role here uh, and already like a, a, like a, a first spoiler overconfident people actually do prefer algorithmic curation and I'm going to explain to you why. Um, so we all know that like, you know, the change that there's a change in news consumption from going to a kiosk where you would buy like your, your favorite news uh, article in the morning. We now often have these kind of situations where we're recommended um, by our apps or we have not even like one subscription to a newspaper anymore, but we use something that compiles several types of news um, of news articles from different um, from different newspapers and we read that because we just want to be updated on the things that we actually like uh, and this is a pattern that uh, has actually caused many people to raise concerns you already heard them by Sana before and by my colleague Johanna before um, there are very very much concerns about that algorithms changes in, in certain ways that, um, for privacy reasons or for uh, all sorts of polarization reasons. Uh, but at the same time, if you think about people just, you know, reading hello uh, or any variation of the country that there is uh, to catch up with celebrity gossip, or as I said, your favorite sports team, it might actually be very, very useful, um, you know, make use of your time to actually have these algorithmic curations because there's nothing really worried about like you know I'm interested in the Kardashians just give me all the information about the Kardashians and I don't need to know about whatever other family there is or, or about soccer or something at the same time when this is about like the state of the economy or the state of politics uh, we actually do have some concerns because we think like oh people are maybe only uh, getting information from like-minded sides so we don't have a balanced diet we cannot really make up our mind we get very um, one way or one way curtail information, and that might actually widen the gap between people that have a certain position versus the opposite position. Um, so we actually ask this, ask and answer these questions: uh, Are the different ways that we use the news for do they affect how we uh, appreciate uh, algorithmic news selection? So whether or not we get these updates from the app. Uh, and the second one is, you know, there are all these causes for concern, as I said before, and also highlighted by my two colleagues before. And at the same time, we see across the board that people really value uh, algorithmic news selection, uh, but algorithms in, in general. And um, the privacy concerns are always less than you would really like them to be because it's something that is, uh, you know, long time or things it doesn't apply to me. So often we think that. This is what other people are. They have their own bubbles and they live in their own bubbles. But I am a very much of a special case. I don't know why it doesn't, uh, it does now come up. I'm a very much of a special case and I'm able to, you know, pinch each and every bubble and I, you know, connect all these bubbles as well. Um, so we ask like people that have this idea of themselves that they're extremely overconfident about their own ability to pinch their, uh, their burst, their bubbles. Uh, do they have a specific, uh, do they have higher uh, appreciation for algorithms and speci specifically when they look for politics or e economy, these type of um, domains of news. Um, and what we find is that um, unfortunately, like regardless of what you use the news for, 
we do not find any difference in how much you appreciate uh, algorithmic curations. You almost always appreciate them positively, whether or not you use them just for fun or to escape, you know, waiting on the bus or the tram or the metro, uh, and you go through your feed line, or uh, whether you actually are looking for certain topics, you actually like it that um, these are already suggested for you. It, it saves time. Uh, and this we found both in the Netherlands as well as in the US. So kind of in a broad way, people do appreciate these algorithmic selection, like algorithmic curation. Um, and this is a little bit more concerning, I think. Uh, overconfident people, so people where we ask them certain, let's say, skill questions that thought that they were doing really well in this test, but actually did not, uh, they had a lot of appreciation for algorithmic, especially in the domain uh, or when they used um, use them to search for pol political news or economical news. Um, and, and here we think that this is actually a problem because these people think that they are the ones that burst bubbles, that this doesn't apply to them, that they might not be caught in whatever filters or uh, there might be. Um, they think that they will be above that. But they and they have a high value in in these algorithmic uh, curations. Um, so this is what we uh, have a little bit more of a balance. So in a way, people do value algorithms, which is a that's what we find that's a, probably a good thing for many things for many domains of the news. At the same time, the more concerning part, uh, and I think there is where also Johanna's talk about tracking is comes in, is that uh, if people have the idea that they're not in a bubble or they're not in a particular, uh, they don't get particular information that's curtailed for their preferences, they also might not look anymore for the other side, which means that they get into a, like a funnel of more and more the same news. And that might be a concern. Um, as I said, I do this together with Felicia. We're very happy to be contacted about this study and we have all our materials here. So next to that, the, the, um, the journal is fully open. We also have all our materials open so if you want to you know read the study or find more information uh we're happily inviting you to go there thank you so much um thank you. stop share yes thank, thank you. you so much Lydia. very good thank you marie and um manuel pasqual now from el país you please turn the audio on Oh, yeah. no. Yes. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm going to be real fast because I try to be so always. And, uh, you know, after hearing three scholars, uh, journalists can add uh, very few uh, relevant things, I think. Um, I'm going to talk from my perspective. I'm a journalist and I work in a. Uh, Newspaper, which is not an especial, an especial sized uh, publication. I mean, uh, mean or one of our biggest problems uh, when writing on privacy and algorithms and so on is trying to make it uh, clear or try to make uh, things understandable for for people who don't necessarily know anything about it. So. Um, uh, the first thing I would like to say is that in the last three, four years, we have sort of noticed that privacy is an issue. Uh, uh, we can see the metrics of uh, the news, the pieces of uh, the news we write, and sometimes uh, the pieces related with privacy suddenly um, start to to yeah to gather some readers. Uh, it's been a tendency in the last yeah two two three four years more or less um normally uh, it's rated with disasters for instance we <coughs> uh, we covered um uh, the, the case of robert williams you know this american black man who was uh, wrongfully detained uh, by the police when a personal recognition system uh, uh, said uh, he was uh, I don't know, robbing a, I don't know, a shop or something when it wasn't, and uh, you know that uh, it was a uh, system failed. And we, we we brought the, the issue of uh, algorithmic, uh, algorithmic bias and and so on. So 
<coughs> we try to sort of uh, use these uh, disasters uh, in order to 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 place uh, uh, debates like like this one because uh, normally I can tell you it's not easy to <laughs> go to my editor or my boss and tell him okay I want to write on uh, yeah algorithmic bias and he says okay what does my mother uh, has to have to know about that and that <clears throat> And that's uh, that, that's a point. That's a point. We ha we have also seen that uh, on the other hand, people uh, care a lot of uh, the news uh, related with privacy and companies. Uh, for instance, uh, last year uh, when Apple uh, said that uh, their uh, their products were going to uh, give the chance to people to to uh, decide whether the apps you download are going to um, track your your movements or not that was a, a piece where that was uh, very red um google has just uh, today announced uh, something as well but well, these things uh, uh, sort of interest uh, people and and we can say as well that there's an issue regarding privacy because even the us is appears to to be starting to of thinking of uh, passing a sort of federal law, uh, well, we, we will see if they finally do, regarding uh, privacy. And well, as you know, California has already already done it. Um, another another attendance we've, we've seen is um, uh, people sort of give it for granted that they're going to be tracked. And, and but uh, they don't like the bad consequences of it. Uh, when we try to uh, speak in abstract terms, uh, which is the perhaps you know, from a theoretic point of view, the, the clearest way of, of, of assessing a problem, uh, nobody reads us <laughs> bad. When we see a, a, a bad example, uh, that's that's right. Um, there's also, we have also to fight uh, with uh, the certain media coverage uh, regarding this kind. What I, what I want to say is that not all the journalists are equally uh, suspicious of, of technology or, or, or try to assess uh, to what extent uh, should we embrace a technology or not. Um, for instance, I've read uh, pieces that are very, um, uh, well, that, uh, that, that thing that it's uh, fine, for instance, that in Britain, the metropolis uh, uh, has deployed uh, facial recognition systems in the streets and they see it like, uh, okay, that's a, uh, a thing that should be done here in Spain as well, for instance. Um, um but on the other hand when you when we wrote about uh, afghanistan uh, you know when uh, this summer i think it was uh, when the taliban uh, took power again in the country and they they got to uh, they re they they started to use biometric data that was uh, had been uh, collected by the americans and left there to uh, to to punish and and locate uh, people, then you say, okay, may perhaps this technology that we are sort of embracing that uh, special recognition, it's it's not a it's not a good one or it's not a perfect one. Uh, well, uh, I think uh, Sane has spoken about micro-targeting uh, in political micro-targeting, which is a perfect example, I think, of uh, the use of a rather unknown uh, technology and originally used in marketing and that can uh, be have catastrophic consequences in for democracy. Even. Um, <coughs> we uh, um some media as well we try not to do so i mean i'm not saying we are perfect but we try uh sort of uh 
normalize the use of technologies. And uh, I think our first duty as journalists, in my in my case, should be and as civil society as well, should be uh, assessing first before deploying a technology if this uh, technology is going to add something or it's going to serve somebody uh, who's going to lose with it and, and and the thing that that sometimes we forget i think is that it's really us who decides if something is legal or illegal what i mean is that uh, it's been taken for granted for many many years that uh, big companies are entitled to release whatever technology they like uh, without uh, having uh, any type of control um, and, and that's not so that's not so um, well uh, <coughs> i think yeah uh, our duty uh, as, as media is trying to well at least raise these issues and, and make people speak about them uh, you, you have mentioned uh, Algorithmic audits, I think it's a, a key. Uh, they are paramount in order to try to balance uh, this, as I said, continued release of uh, technologies that can potentially alter our lives, not necessarily in a good way. And uh, hopefully, uh, the European Union is going to uh, make it make these audits uh, compulsory or at least uh, feasible. Which is something that it's been uh, talked about as well in Spain. Um, another thing uh, that I think uh, it's interesting in the debate of uh, the raising concerns on privacy and algorithm and, and algorithm, algorithmic biases and and everything is that we are just at the beginning. I mean, there are many technologies that are going to be released soon that are going to add on this and then that we are gonna suddenly uh, have in our lives. Uh, I'm speaking about self-driving cars, which I don't know, uh, it's been like 10 years, uh, everybody's saying that next year are gonna come, but I, I guess some, some year they will come finally. Um, and I said, I mentioned facial recognition because it's, uh, I think it's a very clear uh, technology that uh, uh, people can really uh, feel the, the the, to what extent can, can can it can be a threat to our privacy, and but there are many others. Uh, we're speaking about metaverse now. Uh, what is metaverse? Why why should we uh, embrace it uh, without first uh, thinking very carefully? Uh, what can we have? We have to use it. We have to uh, uh, embrace uh, what can what it can add. I'm sure it will be. It will help people uh, to to get more united and so on. But of course, we have to see the, the dark side of it. Um, um, yeah, uh, I wanted to mention some of the things, but you've, you've already done it, so it has no sense now. Um, the problem, perhaps. Uh, I mean, I'm not. But I'm not. I'm not anybody, uh, and I'm not entitled to, to give any solution, but um, uh, we have taken for granted as well that the default, uh, I'm, I'm speaking about companies and, the, and how companies uh, collect our data and then work with it and uh, profile us and sell it and so on. We've, and at some point, we gave, uh, we uh, sort of uh, accepted that the default is uh, everybody's going to collect our data, our data, unless we say no. Um, why it's not the opposite? Why, why it's not um, okay? Uh, anyone, any 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 technological uh, company or anybody who wants to collect your data has to specifically uh, specifically uh, ask you for it, and then if you consent, they can work with it. Uh, again, it's something we can do. Uh, unfortunately, it seems like we need a big catastrophe or a big disaster to happen before we realize uh, uh, that we can change things. Like in the case of Cambridge Analytica regarding uh, micro-targeting, that everybody started to speak about micro-targeting, political micro-targeting after the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Um, 
and well, that leads me to the final point, which is uh, from, I, I think I'm very European when I say that we need uh, more regulation regarding technology. Um, I think it's clear uh, water that we, uh, that self-regulation doesn't work, uh, or at least it doesn't work always. Um, we are Europeans. <laughs> I think everybody knows this continent uh, because of our sometimes uh, felt as excess of laws but i think in regarding uh, technology i think it's a it's a must it's a must um that would be all from my part i'm sorry for this uh, thank you <clears throat> thank you manuel thank you for your presentations we are now in the q a part and i would like to circle back our presentations starting perhaps with uh, with sane to ask uh, if you could talk a little bit about the impact uh, of, in mental health. By, it's a question by Margarita Navarro. She asks, can you talk a little bit about Sane, uh, mental health in this, in this topic? Yeah, I, I did not uh, study uh, um, uh, algorithms and influence on mental health uh, specifically, but we did a study uh, during the, when the pandemic uh, started. Uh, we were interested in people, uh, how much news they consumed and whether they avoided some, no, some news and how that impact their mental health. Because we all know that feeling, especially in the beginning of the pandemic, called a little bit doom scrolling or that you try to find more information and uh, and we found uh, especially during the start of the pandemic uh, people consumed more news but on the other hand we saw that if people tuned out a little bit so now and then that it helped their mental health that they stayed a little bit more uh, felt more uh, a little bit better so i think in that sense there's uh, definitely a relationship between that uh, uh, news consumption and over and, and it's sometimes okay to pause a little bit uh, and to say well this is influencing my uh, my mental health um, and of course there are other specific fields right uh, because the influence of algorithm is is, is diverse um, so there are also specific studies and i saw also some specific studies online uh, but i'm not the expert here on that so um uh, but if you want to, uh, you can always send an email to me and uh, I will look them up and I will send them to you. I hope that answers your question in a little bit. Sunny, thank you very much. Joanna, there's a question I believe I can uh, give it to you considering your presentation. It's by Sylvia Killing. She asks, what are the research methodologies in place to study algorithmic awareness and perception? Are there any you have employed yourself or have found more convincing? Um, yes, uh, thank you very much. It's a very um, yeah, important question and um, very interesting question. Of course, there are different uh, possibilities and methods to measure something like algorithmic awareness or maybe algorithmic literacy and um, advertising literacy, which is also very important in this um, case. Um, it's difficult because um, yeah, you use uh, And I think we have um, self report. Um, are you aware of um, of how self reports or scales in order to ask people algorithms are working? But um, it's it's very difficult to only rely on uh, such self reports. Although um, literacy and knowledge about this is very important, and you can can ask it. And actually, in our current study, we also. Um, yeah, ask about advertising literacy, specifically in uh, with regard to political advertising. Um, other methods would be to show people, um, yeah, political advertisements and ask people whether they know these pictures, whether they saw they uh, them already, and whether they think they are targeted to them and. Uh, how they are targeted to them. So this is the algorithm which um, is behind this um, yeah, reason or which is reason why people see specific advertisements. And if you ask them what we think, why do we see it, um, could be one step um, in combination with a self-report about advertising or algorithmic, algorithmic literacy. But of course, it's, it's very difficult because people often um, yeah, cannot define exactly what is the algorithm behind everything. So it's it's a difficult question, a good question, and uh, I hope I could uh, give you some insights in, in my thoughts on that. Thank you, Joanna. I'm going to jump to Marika now and the question we received uh, by Athena Karatsogiani. 
are there in your study any indications about the underconfident and what applies there? Yeah, so thank you so much for your question. Uh, I had to look quickly into the data because I didn't notice by heart. So thank you also Rico, for giving me some time. So what we see for certain, like if, if I just zoom into like people that use news mainly for, um, let's say information about democracy, politics, and, and econ economy, is that if you're underconfident, you always have a lower level of um, uh, appreciation for algorithms, that regardless of how much, how much you use, um, let's say political news uh, during the week. So even if you know, know you use just a couple of days a week, uh, you still appreciate it less. And we see that if you um, have lots of overconfidence, you appreciate algorithms more regardless also like you see that of course the more you actually use news for this gate for this particular domain the more you also trust the algorithm that also holds for the underconfident but they're just um they go from very uh, untrustworthy to a little bit untrustworthy and the overconfident go from let's say neutral to very happy with the algorithms so that's a little bit of a different uh it's the same pattern but uh it's a flip side of the scale Thank you. Thank you, Morgan, for your answer. Let me circle back now to Manuel. We have a question. I'd like to hear your answer on this uh, from Michael Litkov. Uh, you, you'd like to, he'd like for you to talk a little bit about efforts and strategies for algorithmic literacy. So in your case, uh, are you journalists trained on this? Uh, good, what about the tools that you need to explore and write about these topics? Your personal experience um, as an expert in algorithms, how would you say? Well, I wish I could say yes, we are trained, um, uh, but no, we don't, we don't have anything uh, about our spare time to read. Uh, to obviously, I have uh, the chance to speak with people like you who have who are real, real scholars and who know about these these subjects. But no, we don't have any tool, as far as I know, and we don't have any. Uh, kind of uh, educational support and I would also stress that we don't they, our editors even don't pay uh, much attention to us uh, when 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 working on this type of subject as unless as I said something happens that somebody gets killed or something somebody uh, and I think that was the question yeah it was that, yes. Thank you, Manuel, for your answer. Uh, Joanna, there was, we received a question that you kindly um, answered by written, but I think it would be important that all the, the speakers would listen about. It's by Sandra Yepesen. I'm going to read the question for everyone. It's about the perception of data tracking by the public. So it seems that people can easily understand uh, the concerns when algorithms go wrong, such as the example Manuel just gave, or in the instance of data breaches or identity theft. However, they find it harder to understand data privacy concerns when the data tracking algorithms are functioning correctly, although these concerns are many and varied. So can you please, Joanna, comment on any observations about this with respect to public perception and education? Yes, um, of course. Um, this is also very important. And um, uh, I think that the problem here is that if algorithms um, work, you probably don't really perceive them or you don't know that they are working. So everything works and nothing uh, to worry. This is actually something good um, uh, if you want to say so. So you don't need to be concerned about something if everything goes right. But if you um, see or perceive that something uh, doesn't go right and um, there is a a misconception, an error, or something which disturbs you in, in your um, yeah, behaviors or in, in, in a specific, specific situation, then you uh, start to think about it and start being concerned about it. It's um, similar to yeah, privacy. If you have sufficient privacy, or if you're um, happy with your level of privacy in a specific situation, then, then you don't need to be concerned. But if privacy is absent or your level of privacy is not um, yeah, the level you want 
used to have, then you start being concerned and try to have or to um, build a situation in which the privacy level is acceptable for you. And I think it's similar to the situation. If there something doesn't go uh, right, then you start being concerned. Um, and if you don't perceive being uh, perceive mistakes or something going wrong, then you are not very much concerned in the situation. And with regard to um, public understanding, awareness and educational methods or measures, I think um, this is one reason why it's so important to raise awareness about algorithms and the functions um, of algorithmic um, strategies, because um, yeah, if you don't perceive something going uh, something goes wrong if you don't perceive that algorithms are working in the background then you can't do anything about it so we need to educate um, and train literacy and raise awareness about this topic in order to yeah address this concern uh, this meta concern so to say thank you joanna i would perhaps uh finish with the last question to sana uh, we received uh, from Anna Katarina Bozilio. Thank you, Anna. The question is, do you think that women are one of the groups that has more misconceptions regarding algorithms? Is this the reflex of a traditional societal pressure that links men and technologies, or is it more connected to other social phenomena? Can we hear your takes on this, Anna? Um, I tried to look up the answer uh, uh, as well in, in the paper, uh, because it's not my paper. Um, it's from Brahim Sarali, but I also could not find it. Um, I know that Marika is also working very much on uh, uh, questions like this, so maybe she knows the answer. I know that we find, find this more uh, uh, often also in, in research, but maybe she knows the answer why there is uh, uh, um, so much a difference between uh, um, women uh, compared to men. Can we hear our takes, Marika, on this topic? Yeah, do you know? Uh, I'm, I'm yes, so, so we looked also into it, like are women more overconfident or less overconfident than therefore? So we found like, you know, probably like in line with stereotypes, men are more overconfident. Uh, so it could also be that men just feel that they are more, um, they get the technique better or they, so it doesn't need to be that they are more experts on it. That's the common perception and that is a perpetuating pattern because men seem to be the more technical ones. They also get much more opportunity, so it can be perpetuating. It doesn't know that the actual skill is uh, is a difference. It can just be the perception and thereby also the, the feeling of expertise that you have. But we didn't look like really deep into it further than, you know, is there a difference between men and women? And yes, there is. Thank you. Thank you, Marikan. Uh, I think we have reached the time uh, of our webinar. I would like to conclude with two notes. So the thematic issue that served as base for this event is available in Media and Communications website. The link is now available again on the chat. Uh, as always, it's fully open access. The second note, this event was recorded and will be soon uploaded to our YouTube channel. So all the attendees and speakers will be able to watch or rewatch uh, this event. I would like to thank all the speakers, Sane, Joanna, Marikan and Manuel for your participation here today. And of course, to our attendees to your question, for your questions and engagement with our speakers. I'll see you all in our next webinar. Thank you.